So at the end of our previous video, I ran yarn start inside the HAX uh, part of the LRN Web Components repo. So now I've got a watch directory running and it's, it's gonna let us work on the hacks editor. Now the hacks editor is really complex. So whenever this window pops up with a documentation, you're definitely gonna have to wait a few seconds and hit refresh. Um, if you see in the analyze here, it says, cause it's a watch directory, um, it's, it took 13 seconds to analyze the repo to actually kick out this dot, this little mini doc site. And it's because of all the dependencies of S the Spider. But so I could hit demo and it'll start to load in different parts of hacks. And because of the way Polymer Serve works, which is um, a command line tooling to let us work on this in, in a live editing environment, um, it's gonna take a little bit of time, it has to cache assets, and you'll actually see this Babel notification about styles <laughs> because um, it's doing a lot of runtime transformation to make this happen. So the first time it boots up, it will be a little sluggish to be perfectly honest, specifically with Hacks, just because it's compiling so many different assets to make sure that it, um, it works on the fly. Um, and you'll actually potentially see multiples of these pop up. You'll see I hit refresh for a reason. There we go, there's another one. Okay, so after it hits about two on the command line, then we should have, yeah, now it's all the assets are fully cached and it starts to work a lot faster. Um, the other thing you can do with any of our repos, is you notice the path that it opens with looks like this, components at LRN web components slash name of the element. If you just add demo on the end, you can get access to what's going on in that little demo space. Now I do this quite frequently just because I don't care about that other, um, auto-generate documentation stuff most of the time. I care about working on just this element in a vacuum, especially with hacks because it takes up and encompasses a lot of the UI. So the problem that I'm working on today is, I'm open the make tab here. I had this idea and um, we had some comps a while ago, of basically doing the equivalent of, if you've opened up, um, I, I'm not as familiar with the, iPhone dashboard, but uh, on Android, when you open up your phone and you pull up all apps, right, and it flies up from the bottom, you've got all these little circles with the name of whatever it is in a big grid, and then it's a searchable list, so I could say like H5P, and it'll filter out to just H5P. Um, now, I generally like this idea. The thing I don't like is uh, when I tab through, see it does this like bring, to the fo bring your focus to what it is. It's kind of clunky um, and it requires a lot of overlapping white space, right? So I could put a lot more stuff on here. If this, you know, if I click to ripple, you see how large that ripple is. So it has to have a lot of real estate here. I want to just edit the CSS of these, not do this pop over thing um, and just make it be able to show a lot more information in less space. Now I could scroll down. We have a lot of elements here. Um, working on a preview of what these are so that when you focus on it, it actually shows you a preview of what you're doing uh, is a next, a next step for us for sure. But the first one is let's do a better job of utilizing this white space and not do this goofy zoom effect. So that's the context of what I'm trying to solve. So what I would do typically, and especially cause you know, again, we have like 300 elements. I haven't made all of them. Um, our team has made a lot of elements that I don't know the structure of fully is I would hit inspect and start to kind of reverse engineer like what is the element I'm trying to get at here. So you can see that in this element, there's an iron icon, there's support for an iron image, although we haven't used it in this case. Um, and then that is in the shadow root of a hacks item button inner. Okay, and that's green. So I bet if I tweak this to be like blue, that it'll update that to be blue. Okay, starting to get a feel for what this API is, even though I don't know what it is at the moment. Um, that is contained within a paper button in the light DOM. The reason I know it's in the light DOM of it, see how it's not contained in shadow root there. So I have shadow root collapsed of paper button itself, and this item's still here. Uh, but I can see that hacks item button inner, actually it's shadow root has all this icon and everything else. So I bet that's defined in it. That is stuffed inside something called hacks gizmo browser item. Has an elevation of one. I bet if I hover over something that might have a higher elevation. There we go, it's two. And then it'll go back to one. Yeah, you'll see the data update because I'm not, no longer hovering it. Um, now that's stuffed inside something called gizmo container. And that is living in something called iron list. 
and that is in something called Graffito Filter, and that is in something called Hacks Gizmo Browser. So if I'm trying to work on these things in general, I'm gonna have to either look for Hacks Gizmo Browser in this case, or Hacks Gizmo Browser Item. Most likely those are my two starting points, right? Because I'm trying to influence this individual button. So I am aware of the structure of Hacks, obviously, because I wrote this one. So I can cheat a little bit, but I know that all of the pieces that make up the Hacks interface actually live under Hacks Hyphen Body, as far as the repo name. So looking at that, and again, sticking with our structure in the mono repo, right? I'm in the mono repo. These are all the elements that live in line. Uh, the HAX tag is just an encapsulation of other Hacks tags. Um, think of Hacks as like the skeletal structure. It has all these different bones and ligaments but that the HAX tag is actually kind of the body that's stitching it all together. Um, you could actually create your own invocation of how the HAX tag should work, like um, making a WYSIWYG hyphen hacks tag as an example, which wraps the HAX tag, um, just as far as how abstract this is. But hacks body is where the vast majority of the things associated with this live. Um, so if it's hacks hyphen something, it's going to be in here. Um, now, within there, you can see that there's a hacks-body.js in here. Um, we do a really good job of keeping our element names the same as the file name. And then the a convention that we use in our mono repo is, much like we had demo for where the demo is, src for the source of that element. If there are supplemental elements or things related to that element that don't make sense on their own, we put those under lib. And so there's a lot of things in the hacks-body uh, lib directory, as you can see. Um, but it's going to give us access to all those different pieces. So the piece that I said I was looking for is Gizmo Browser. So now, because we name these appropriately, I can find Hacks Gizmo Browser and Hacks Gizmo Browser Item. So let's look at Hacks Gizmo Browser Item first. We'll see. It implements Hacks Item button inner. Okay, it extends a Polymer element. It puts a whole bunch of event listeners on it as far as mouse down, mouse move, focus in, cool. So that's probably what's doing the scaling. Um, it also implements this after next render, and this is something I'm starting to get rid of. Um, but after next render is a timing thing so that the events are binded uh, to this element after it's already been painted to the screen. Um, this is a very minimal timing type of gain potentially. It's a very Polymer specific convention. And we're actually trying to, as part of this, get away from Polymerisms, if you will, um, and back closer to what the platform, quote unquote, in this case, the platform being the web, being vanilla JavaScript, being that someday I want this to actually read HTML element. That this item that you're view viewing just extends the browser's built-in class so we're not going to mess with converting this into lit element or even a vanilla JS element today. I'm just going to work on that CSS. But if you see things like after next rendered around our code, it is for timing issues. Now I'm going to take this out because I don't care that much <laughs> about, about that specific timing issue. That's a little uh, crazy as far as performance obsession. Um, so you can see I have this doing it in a constructor. In a Polymer element, you have a template tag, and the or sorry, template method, and template is going to return something that's in an HTML, which is in this case imported function here, HTML helper, and the HTML is going to have styles. It's going to have our actual HTML guts of what it is, and you'll see here we have, hey, on click, fire an event, right? So the button is kind of a dumb button. It's just for visual purposes, and in fact, if we look, it's not even just for visual purposes, right? It's a wrapper on top of something called button inner, which is purely visual. So uh, then we have some properties associated with it, um, which is you know a nice thing that Polymer element and lit element both give you is access to just defining properties in one area. And then you see I have my tap events and things that end up toggling the elevation, right? So if I were to manually set this elevation on the browser item to be two, you'll see it nicely animates up. But that's the thing we're trying to get rid of. <laughs> so we want to do more of just like a focus as opposed to this like tab through type of a thing. Um, or have something be that it's, you know, focused as opposed to any of this elevation stuff. So we do have 
you know, a nice, have done a pretty decent job of ensuring um, that hover state is uniform with tab state. So I can tab through these or I can hover over them um, or I can click them and all three of these actions are actually gonna execute the same visual treatment. So I do kinda wanna keep the elevation connotation, I like that. Um, I'm not gonna do the scaling though, cause it's obnoxious. <laughs> so what we're gonna do instead is elevation one is nothing. Um, I don't care about elevation one. What I care about is elevation two. And now we might want to, uh, there's no, Let's see what was in there is transform. There's no timing associated with how it nicely animates that. So we might want to do, um, let's do color black in this case, because it is black text. And let's make that zero, zero. Or actually, let's make it more of like a, right? So something that's off black. But then we're going to transition it to a full solid black there. Um, Okay, and then let's not mess with paper buttons color so that this will cascade through hopefully. And ink color, all right. So I could throttle these based on the elevation um, as far as getting into CSS selectors here. So let's, and then you can see the ink color. The ink color is that, that radial burst thing, basically. So I could say, set the ink color to something relative to the elevation. Now, you're never gonna see the ink color unless you actually inter interact with it, like that I would tab to this thing and hit the space bar, for example, or click, um, right? Those both influence that. So let's just leave that at the quote unquote hacks ink color and we'll make it uh, black as the default. We're gonna take away the color here and we might need to modify it after the fact, but let's see. Okay, so let's even just, let's do that um, before we change anything else. Now, I'm working on this element, and because this is a little demo that's updating, I'm gonna hit refresh on this little mini server if you think of it that way. And now when I open the make tab, now when I hover over these, they don't change. And that was what we were going for. Um, and you can't see the font change, or sorry, the uh, text color change. So that's a problem currently. Now I also want, you know, there'd be like a, a border or some type of focus. So um, we're gonna say border, let's see, or actually outline, sorry. Outline, we'll do zero. And then here we'll do outline uh, one pixel. Uh, and then there's like outline offset. There it is offset. And we'll say it's like two pixels. So we'll say it's two there, then we'll do outline offset zero in this case. So you should get like a little bit of an animation of this kind of opening, if you will. Um, now, as far as the color wasn't being influenced, right? That's because paper button is already having its own connotation of what that is. So we can leverage these host selectors to make a more specific selector on paper button. So then we're gonna do this take away the outlining associated with it. So we're gonna get double outlines and then I'll take away the color associated with just the pure elevation of this element. So let's refresh and see what that does. And this is honestly, this is kind of the process that we go through back and forth with working on these changes to the interface. Um, all right, we can see that that hasn't actually supplied the outline. Now I think, I could be wrong. I think it's related to uh, the focus not being on this element, right? So I was trying to say, hey, if, there, if you're focusing on the element itself, do X. I think the focus is actually maintained by the paper button. So we want to influence the paper button in CSS based on focus change. Let's see, we still just have that color black there. Now it could also be that the focus is on the hacks item button inner, right? And I, I, honestly, this is a process we go through. Like I'm talking through this, um, you know, in real time, if you will, for this reason. Um, so let's look at what hacks item button inner is. If it seems like I don't know how these things are constructed, 
in part it's because that's actually the case. Um, I haven't worked on this in some time. And so when we have 300 some elements, the fact that they're done as web components becomes an easy way to actually go back through and figure out how the hell you even did your own work previously. Um, because we're doing things in a very consistent manner like this. So let's see, the, there's the simple colors of full type in gray for the color of this icon, which is then processed down and updated outside of it. So there's item label that has a color coming in as far as it being theme gray 12. And the item label is right there. That's what sits below it. Um, the other thing I noticed that this does that Android doesn't is, see it says multiple choice. On Android, if this goes more than one line, it just has an ellipses. Um, so I don't want these to wrap. And so I think we could do that with a word or overflow wrap. Maybe it's overflow. Might not be overflow wrap in this case. Let's do overflow wrap. And we could see break word, initial, normal. No, nope, that's not what we want. We want, I think it's called text overflow, maybe? There we go, text overflow. We want ellipses. And then we want overflow. Perhaps it's hidden. So you can see now it just says multiple. Um, and then we want, I might have to mess with this more later so it doesn't become the only focus of this. <laughs> but um, there's like text overflow, overflow, is it clip maybe? One of these will actually just have it put them all on the same line, but I'm not gonna mess with that for the time being. But we do wanna get it to just be one line in this case. And do text align, center is probably fine still. And then maybe word wrap is word break all. There we go, that's part of what I was going for. All right, word break all, text overflow is ellipsis. And I'll have to work on that later so that actually clips it off appropriately. So this is part of our new design pattern, right? I'll work on this in this one space and go, okay, hacks item button inner now is the thing I need to change, I'm in there. And what I was modifying is ultimately associated with item label. So now I'll update these properties or attributes rather in the CSS for just this one thing. Let's close that because the DOM loads faster when it doesn't have to parse all that. All right, now you can see we have multiple choice and it's getting cut off. Sweet, so that's, now we're getting a little bit closer to what we wanted originally. I can still focus on these, and that's important too, to be able to focus these. Um, but now I've got all this freed up space, to be perfectly honest, because I'm not doing this goofy scaling like I was before. So now I should be able to make the buttons themselves smaller. So these are all, I think it claims to be 70 by 60. And then there's the gizmo browser item. Gizmo browser item is 100 by 100. Okay, so let's see if we can't influence the sizes of those. So the icons in them are 30 by 30. And the width of the item label is 70. Um, let's maybe keep that there. Let's say, oh, there's the box shadow as far as being focused. Hover, all right. You can see it very lightly. I don't know if you can even see that. It very subtly has a box shadow on the button inner, but not the actual item itself. Um, so I kind of want it to be on the item itself, that it would have some form of drop shadow if it's become activated in some way. So maybe let's take um, some of this button inner logic, and we're actually going to apply this to the post itself. I'm not going to put it in the button inner. Do it on host. Oops. And so host will have the box shadow and a transition for the element, the uh, properties within it. And then the way I do this button inner is I do colon host 
And then if you're doing a post base selector, then you have to wrap this pseudo selector like this. And then I'll do the same thing for focus, host. Okay. And we'll do it for active as well. All right. Save. Um, padding on that being five. I don't think we'll end up needing that, but we'll, I'm not going to do all the UX, the UI work with this. It's mostly just to show what the process ends up looking like. So going to make, hey, there we go. Now we're starting to get, there's a drop shadow to it, and you can actually see it animate when I go over it. Now I need to make that apply correctly to this having the focus, right, as opposed to that inner item. And so the way that we do that is one, I don't want it to be on at all times. So let's take uh, the transition off of this entirely. Um, and then let's take this focus, hover, and active portion. We're going to copy this out of here. We're going to move it up into the gizmo browser item, right? Because the paper button is the thing actually getting the focus here. <clears throat> and so we're going to apply this not to host. It's going to be to paper button when paper button gets focus or hover. Because that's the thing that's actually doing the work here. And then we're going to put that same, I like that transition of uh, 0.3 seconds. We'll do all these in out, sure. Um, okay, now the elevation wants to adjust the, or when elevation changes, it wants to adjust the outline. And I think the issue with outline is I don't have a color defined, but let's see, outline color, um, I'll just do blue to see if it even is, if that part's working. All right, <clears throat> let's refresh, see what we end up getting. Make, these are just there, oh, okay, there we go. So now, ooh, you know, I actually prefer that over the outline portion. So now when I tab through, I know what I'm selecting based on what is getting that nice smooth animation as far as that box popping up. So already, you can see like that's a, that's, a cleaner effect, right? Previously we had the, did the little goofy zoom and then I'd click and it would do the burst within the zoom and that was kind of stupid to be perfectly honest. So now we can actually drop this whole elevation thing because the elevation aspect isn't really applying in this case at all. <laughs> so let's get rid of that. Now, because I got rid of elevation as a concept, now I can get rid of it in the UI here. I can now take these tap events and get rid of those as well. And the nice thing with the tap event being gone is that now I can get rid of all of this event binding logic. And you see the way that these things can interplay, right? I'm moving back and forth between these two elements by removing <clears throat> what is a seemingly simple UI consideration. I'm actually dramatically reducing the logic that's in JavaScript and putting the focus on CSS where I have a higher chance of it being accessible in the first place. So now I kind of want that item to transition a little more rapidly between those. Um, but it is nice that I can click this and get that burst to happen. So it would be cool if the ink color changed dynamically. That's a little more difficult to do. Um, in this instance, so I won't do that. Uh, fire event is on here, good fire event. Um, and support for voice commands that we're not getting into yet. So I was at least able to remove one aspect of this, right? So that reduced a lot of events being bound in the DOM needlessly. Um, now let's make these not require them to be 100 by 100, right? The, the button itself is 80 with a padding of 10 and a margin of 10. Let's see what happens if we drop that to just 80. All right, so we start to get these things. They look less square, but they are, I'm able to have a lot more of them fit into a tighter space, which was actually part of what I was going for here in the first place. So maybe instead of those being padding 10 and margin 10, let's see if we drop that to uh, 80 and we'll make that max with 90. 
So now these should add up to something that is still largely a square. I've got more of them on here and there's less space between them. Um, so now I've actually reduced the need for scrolling, even with a large number of elements here. And I've dramatically reduced the number of events bound um, at spin up, right? Because I was having six event listeners applied per one of these items that would go on the page. Now I don't want the transition to be 0.3, that seems a little sluggish. Um, let's do 0.2, and we'll make it linear. It'll still apply to everything, um, but I might want to just switch it to drop shadow. So now there is a very minor animation, if you will, right, that this is being visually lifted off the interface for me to select. I can select it. And it has the nice little tap ripple. Honestly, I don't know if I need the tap ripple. And again, these become considerations. I'm just talking through what our, our process is here. Um, but you can see that this solves some nice accessibility issues potentially if we've got this done right. So one, we, we've got performance, but then we've also got the ability to nest things in a way that eliminates potential accessibility concerns, right? So like there being a label here and they're being required to be a label, now when we have the input into it, we'll always make sure we get the right voice reader. If I hit the right key, there we go. Voice over on Chrome, undefined basic iframe button, undefined image button. Undefined basic link button. Undefined paragraph button. Voice over off. All right, so there's an issue, right? Undefined. All of these are saying undefined. So I need to fix whatever is coming up as undefined in the screen reader. Now it is saying, hey, there's that item paragraph. Iron image, I'm going to bet, is probably the thing undefined because I don't have iron image anywhere. Um, we haven't actually implemented that at all yet. So instead of this being here, let's see if we get rid of iron image, if that helps at all. Uh, the icon's not gonna be red, but the label will be. And the label is applied inside of there, as far as title is what it says. And we can see that title is being set above. So let's see what happens now. Let's refresh after we take out the image. Again, now I've reduced the complexity yet again. Now there isn't all that additional load there. Voice over on Chrome, image comparison button, video player button, cover image button, tabs button, self check button, voice over off. And so just there, right, I've made a better experience for assistive technologies just by eliminating, you know, something that wasn't even implemented. We, we weren't using this iron image yet. This is for a potential future functionality, but yet it was going to say undefined for literally every item. Um, accessibility with a label, right? Making sure that there's a label that makes sense so that when it reads that off, it actually does do something valuable. But this can all start to get roped in more holistically to performance, right? I increased the performance of this loading because it doesn't have the events and now doesn't have the iron image involved in it. And so now I can go in and we can remove there should be a reference to iron, there it is, reference to iron image right there. So I can remove iron image from here. So now I've reduced my dependency tree for this to load, right? And this is honestly, like this is a very common um, feedback loop that we go through on the team. We'll revisit one specific thing that we're, we're looking to you know, improve upon. Um, we might say, oh, well, look, there's a constructor which is super. Well, that's not needed, so let's get rid of it. Um, it might be, oh, well, we're adding all these events. We don't really need to. Okay, so let's get rid of those. Um, in this case, it also could be looking at the gizmo browser that implements these. And so we can look in this and see, okay, it dynamically lazy loads the browser item. Cool. The browser items are told, hey, you have a margin of 10 pixels. Well, now I can make that five. Transition is 0.3, but we can make this two and linear. Um, Okay, there's the iron list, and I know you'd have to look into how iron list works. I'm not going to explain how iron list works right now, but uh, this is going to insert into it gizmo.image. Well, we're not even supporting images in this case, so let's get rid of that. And now we don't have that additional data binding happening in the DOM. Um, examples we have future support for tagged insert, title, index, icon, color, author teaser, right? Some of this information is kind of for, for future use. Um, so we're going to leave that portion there for the time being. 
Um, toolbar inner, okay, that's just the toolbar that's wrapped on top of it. And so I can see there's, you know, there is data binding going on here, right? It's passing information down into this. But I can't see any real reason that this needs to be in Polymer Element anymore. And the reason I say that is because it's not really doing any uh, polymerisms, if you will. Um, it's doing some simple data binding, which Polymer isn't required to do. It's doing a very basic event handle, which Polymer also isn't required to do. So I'm going to hit pause on this one. And then I'm going to show the process of converting this Polymer element into a lit element. Now, lit element is an additional um, you know, request load, basically, right? We've got two micro libraries loading in the page. Um, we've got things that are done in Polymer element and things that are done in lit element. Those are two different helper libraries with their own dependency trees. But the unlike other libraries and frameworks that you've ever worked with, this is the only one where I will be able to effectively stage collapse my dependencies um, on, on my own schedule, to be perfectly honest. So I can stage collapse this Polymer element into a lit element or a vanilla JavaScript element while working on the entire application without rewriting everything to be lit element. And it's because these libraries are compatible with each other. So I'm going to pick up on the next one. We're going to talk about what the differences between lit element and polymer element are because there's a lot of misconceptions there. Um, and then actually I'm going to convert this one into a lit element. And we'll see that it's going to function the exact same way because the other code integrating above it is shadow DOM and below it as shadow DOM with data binding neither level care as long as the data is getting there in the right way and everything is you know totally compatible with the way web components as far as the standard works and so these libraries will all play nice together and not care how the other elements are constructed in the dom Oh, please save. Ugh.